Hello, uh, welcome to everybody here as we discuss uh, talking about uh, the film, the documentary Crossing Columbus, which I saw just recently twice and really enjoyed it. I'm here to speak with the filmmaker, Kathy Lee Crane, and the composer who happens to be, full disclosure, a good friend of mine, Beth Custer. <laughs> so um, welcome to you all. Uh, thank, thank you, you for, for coming on board here all the way from Ithaca and from San Francisco. I'm in uh, Ashland, Oregon here representing the Ashland Independent Film Festival. Thank you very much for being here. So, um, Kathy. Yes. Where did this idea originate? How did you come across this uh, notion to do a documentary about this very interesting annual rite that they perform in Columbus? Uh, I... Um, first of all, thanks for having me, and I'm glad that everyone's got to see it. Unfortunately, the people probably who are listening to this now have not had the luxury you had, which is to see the film twice. But <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like I, oh, well, my films usually sort of like a really good wine, kind of enjoy having, you know, time. Yeah. Um, and in this case, maybe not like wine. Uh, in any event, so yes. Um, because you don't want to have the same wine twice. Okay, so I um, started the film project because in the archive, and I was working on a film about World War One, the Manhattan Front, which Beth also did the score for, and it I found all this footage of Pancho Villa in the desert, and more than that, I saw all this footage of the U.S. Army in the desert, and and I was born and raised in Arizona. And to me, that's an odd image. Even though there are military bases throughout the Southwest, that historical image I had never really seen before. So it led me to ask a few questions. Well, what was that? What was what was being recorded? And then I found out that there was this event at Columbus. And then I went even further and discovered that they do an annual commemoration of it. And so before I knew it, I was on my way. Well, that's one to that area. But, you know, I, I have never seen that Pancho Villa footage ever. I've seen a lot of uh, old reels of Pancho Villa here and there, but those particular those particular reels that you have shown in there, I don't know that I've ever seen them at all. If they've ever been included in any other documentary or archive footage shown on TV or in film ever, it's really really remarkable to have that there, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, usually, I mean, I could go on for a very long time about the use of archival footage and how protocols of licensing make it nearly impossible to actually do what I like to do with uh, are the archival material, which is to let it play. Mm -hmm. And usually the archive is used as an illustration, and I'm much more interested in being able to watch Pancho Villa just standing there wiping his brow by the side of the train. Take two, yeah. walk. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's like, wow, okay, it's already incomplete, the archive, the history of the record, let's say, but to, to watch what's there is really wonderful. And one of the things I do is like, when I look at the archive, I'm like, have I ever seen this image before? Yeah, or do I even have a sense of having seen it before? And if I haven't, then I'm like, okay, that's in the movie. Yeah. That's in and, the movie. Yeah. And, and I have the same reaction to seeing the soldiers that came up and uh, in reaction to that with General Pershing. Uh, all, I think, before World War One, right? Oh, yeah. Well, so that was the thing. I was doing this research for world, this World War One film, how it was waged in New York, which is also an obscure story. Um, but in any event, so Pershing, the hell was he doing in the desert from 1916 to 1917 besides training himself to be the U.S. general in Europe? When yeah. the U.S. finally entered World War I in 1917, Pershing had already spent a year in the desert boning up, you know? <laughs> I don't know. There's some quirky images that are in both the archival <laughs> footage and in your footage that, that are, you know, have a, a, a kind of, uh, well, it's just, they're just funny. They're really humorous. Like somebody, uh, like seeing all those soldiers doing hopscotch as part of training, <laughs> military training. Yeah. <laughs> That was very funny. It's, uh, they're all mugging for the camera, too. It's, it doesn't change. They're just young guys, young kids, getting, thinking, oh, what a lark. We get to go chase Pancho Villa into Mexico and try to catch him. And, you know, they, they, they can't. But I also like the, the footage you shot that includes people talking about um, 
showing you their one beautiful landmark that they love in Columbus, which is the water tower. <laughs> so it's like, we yeah. Listen, the, 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 those people, the people in Columbus are just amazing, but it's, you know, it really kind of a, I mean, I didn't know anybody there. Mm -hmm. I walk into the cafe at the corner. I'm a stranger. And I'm, I said, I'm here because I'm pff, so original. Here, here to see more and learn more about Col Columbus as it pertains to Pancho Villa. Oh, Pancho Villa. Yeah. Because that's all they're known for. And then so yeah. people come through there. There's a historical society on one corner of this intersection. There's a cafe. There's the water tower. And then there's the Pancho Villa State RV Park. That's the intersection of Columbus. The RV park? <laughs> Call, yes. Yeah, RV park. <laughs> the RV park, really yeah. Funny. Pancho Villa State Park. Now, did you, did, did you go into Mexico to ride, come back, tracking I, I, I wasn't with them. Um, I wasn't with the Cabalgata in Chihuahua. I had another team of, of a photographer and a translator and a, a producer down there that basically spent the last three days as they were heading up towards Palomas where they had a big, you know, thing in the, um, the big greeting with the band, the high school band, right. love yeah. that so much. The little military uh, procession. Formation. Formation, yeah. Yeah, and then all the way, and then we had already been recorded, recording in, in Columbus for, well, I was there for eight months. So a lot of this footage was actually captured just myself. With the army, these guys from Fort Bliss. Yeah. You know, that stuff where they're <laughs> with their pointers. Yeah, that's so wild. Uh, so, so. Um, Unbelievable. Did, how long have they been doing this march, this ride? 20, it was 20 years. Yeah, they, they just, I think it was just, they just celebrated their 20th Cabalgata. Cabalgata, that's what it's called. Yeah. The cavalry or cavalcade. Cavalgada, like a cavalcade. Yep. Cavalgada. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, and, it, and, and it's a and it's a, a binational thing. Yeah, totally. So it's run by, you know, it's there's a ton of these rides actually in various historical um, stories that are you know trails, um, but yeah, this one is coordinated because they move across the border, as you know. So it has to be coordinated with customs that they can come over and so easily open the fence i i just <laughs> it's, it's so simple it's so simple which is why my favorite part of the film is the end of it where you know the dog's out you know you're trying to close the fence we're going in for dinner this is like the neighbor get the dog <laughs> I was I was watching that I saw the dog appear and then it ran off camera and they tried to call it back and it was gone. And as they start moving everyone in, you don't blink, the camera stays right there, you don't blink at all, no cutaways. And then they start closing the gates and I started to go, wait a minute, what about the dog? I haven't forgotten the dog. And indeed, one of the guys says, wait a minute, wait a minute, I gotta get the dog. And he starts calling him by his name. And he comes <laughs> running in. Yeah. Like, no, no, even you have to get on the other side of the border. <laughs> There were other amazing little uh, anecdotes, like the anecdote of the of one of the drivers who was uh, telling um, telling the, telling you about uh, how he would, as a child, he would he would play illegal immigrant. It was like a game to them to come more over just to taunt and tease the border patrol and break out. And it was a game to them. Yeah. Until yeah. They started getting older and started realizing, you know, we could this is something we could go to jail for, for a while. You know? Yeah, that school is extremely intense to be right. And it is not only right up to the border fence, but it's right next to the stockyards. So you have oh, these wow. industrial, well, whatever, commer the commercial world, which is the main reason this is a 24-hour commercial port, Columbus. So they're constantly open in chilies and horses, and it's like, you know, commercial port. But is it so, but is there also stockyards like for cattle? Yeah, but that's where they enter. That that they oh, come through the stockyards to cross because they have that gate that can so, handle. So it doesn't smell as bad as, as you know, usually I think of as stockyards like, you know, where they keep a lot of cattle before slaughter. 
That's what you love about the dry heat. There you go. You know, it doesn't become like steamy, you know. But, you know, the school is right there. And um, the, the story of education is actually very important to the story of Pancho Villa. Um, that was his thing. That was like the thing he was most known for amongst, you know, people in the state of Chihuahua, at least many stories about him, was that he, his revolution was about education. He, he wanted everyone to be educated. There's no way that they were going to be able to outrun the ruling class until they were educated. Everyone. Uh, which, you know, most rebel anarchists understand. <laughs> it's pretty crucial. So you've got these kids. They're not, they're not very well funded in Palomas on the Chihuahua side for their school education. And so you have that happening while at the same time you have newly deported um, Mexicans who have children who were born in the United States getting on a bus every day to go get their education in yeah. Columbus. That's just and, crazy. You know that in El, Paso, in El Paso, many of the university students at UTEP yep. are Juarez residents. They are right. born in Juarez. And they commute every day, starting at like 5 a.m., jumping all through all those hoops, going through all the bureaucracy of getting across the border so they can go attend their classes. And, yeah. use that. and then at the end of the night, they go back home. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's very, uh, it, 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 it makes the, the, the border such um, um, an obstacle. It just becomes an yeah. obstacle to these things. I yeah, also I like that. I like the anecdote of, of, of that. I think it was the same guy who said that that they used to hit the longest home runs ever, <laughs> ever. Cierto, they would yeah. go from one country into the other country. And I then love go that the, guy. Go under the that's fence, get the ball, and come right back. It's like, um, that's how, you know, the borders, you know, used, used to be when I was growing up in El Paso. Yeah. It, yeah. it didn't seem that big a deal. But now they have those iron bars. It's just, uh, it's, it's an entirely different set of, of rules that everyone's playing with. Uh, and even yeah. so, they said that as soon as they put it up, a coyote welded right through it, just sawed it off and let yeah. the people through. Uh, and they had to then fill it with cement so that it would make it harder to, the, to, to do that. Yeah, and those posts that have the cement in it and are broken down, those are outside of Douglas, Arizona. I spent a lot of time in the borderlands, not just in Columbus. Yes. And, and that is part of the, I don't even know what they're calling it, rebuilding or building right. uh, the wall is really breaking down these old fence posts and putting in taller fence posts. Oh, gosh. Oh, so man. it's like Sisyphus, you know? They're just yeah. and a very expensive Sisyphus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Rolling it up. Yeah, no, oh, it's, it's how absurd. Long, how long does this ceremony take, this whole thing? Is, so, does it all happen in one day? It depends. Um, the riders spend two weeks riding through Chihuahua. Um, they two think they, weeks? Yeah, yeah. They start in Guerrero. Oh, you're kidding me. N no. Wow. I yeah. thought they started there in Palomas. No, they're cruising. They're there for a while. And wow. yeah, so we couldn't, we didn't, you know, it's not the full picture of everything that's happening on that um, with that group. And then uh, they cross over for the fiesta in Columbus on the first Saturday after the anniversary. Mm -hmm. The anniversary is March 9th. That's when the memorial happens at the depot and you got the you know, the veterans and the border patrol flags and that whole sort of somber experience. And then sometimes those days are the same day. March 9th yeah. is the Saturday. Yeah. And so then you've got Viva Via coming through. <laughs> really fast. Memorial. Right. Yeah. Right. It was really interesting to hear uh, for you to present the various takes on this particular uh, event in history and how, they're, how it's commemorated from both uh, the more nationalistic American side and then the more uh, cultural, as well as naturalistic from Mexico side, their own approach into uh, and how they view 
um, what happened in Columbus. Um, and there are various interpretations of it being like a, a bad gun deal gone, a gun deal gone bad, gone yeah. bad, or yeah. just a raid that he just came and raided just because he wanted to. Um, and or because he was no longer being recognized by Wilson. Yeah, it, yeah, that's right, because of the changing presidency and yeah. Um, I'm going to shift over to to Beth just so just to get yeah, her involved totally. in this, so she has something, Yay. some contribution in this. How oh. did you meet Kathy? How do you know Kathy Lee Crane? We used right. to be neighbors. Well, no, actually, Kathy came uh, to a transmission show and became a fan. I think she came to a Oakland transmission show and became a fan, and then we became friends, and then we ended up being neighbors, and then we just started hanging out in my backyard on Lundy's Lane. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then she asked me to score one of her films and I used some transmission music and then she just has kept, he, she keeps asking me to score a film. So I keep saying yes. That's wonderful. <laughs> what, was, what was your, uh, did you have a different approach to this film than to the prior ones? Yes, because the directive for this one was she wanted a lot of tones. Mm -hmm just tones to kind of, and there were a lot of tones that were in the filming of it. There were, I don't know exactly what they were, but there were a lot of these tones that I built layers of tones on. But then the thing that really inspired me was the, the horses and the movement of the legs. The shot with the horse's legs is just one of my favorites. And yeah. I created that whole kind of trip poppy rhythmic thing, watching the horses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and how um, far into the process were you brought in? Were you able to go out to New Mexico? Uh, no, I was brought in after the film was pretty much done. And so after the editing process? Yeah, I mean, she invited me when she was in residence, but I just never made it happen. I see. Yeah. Uh, I well, it's really unobtrusive, it's, and it's very subtle. And yeah. it moves at the rhythm of the film. You also both have a real good instinct of when to pull away, to not have any sound at all, to just mm -hmm. let the, the 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 footage speak for itself, to create its own, let it establish its own soundscape. And then I would find, as I was watching it, I, I'd realize, oh wait, there's this lovely, like it, it almost sounds like guitar or bass sound that just is creates a kind of rhythm of like writing. Yeah, and but, when, well, the other thing that's unique, unique about this score is that I played almost all the instruments, the, you know, rather than using virtual, except for the course of the cello, I use virtual cello and the, <laughs> the drum beat, but all the other instruments, the ukulele, right. of course the clarinets and the voice and piano I played. Yeah. It was all you, all the instrumentation was you? Yeah. You didn't hire any of our mutual buds? No, not this time. <laughs> See, this is the benefit of having someone like Beth Custer involved. <laughs> is because she is a, a one-woman band. She's a one -woman <laughs> band. And, you know, we all, <clears throat> Beth and I have had long conversations about the political state of the United States mm -hmm. over the course of our friendship. And, of course, the story of the, the U.S.-Mexico border it was, is, is never a dead topic. It's always... Oh, yeah. And it, it's really hardcore. I was down there after, you know, Trump had been elected for like a year, when it, right at the high end of his insanity on it. Um, but I just wanted to say about Beth. So when I, when this material, when I sent it to Beth, I really wanted, I really wanted her to sort of take her, give her own take to it. Um, and so there was this, the humorous tuba stuff that happens at the beginning and the end it wasn't originally yeah. at the beginning yeah, yeah yeah i loved it so much because it's so contrary to the somber tone <laughs> that i in the poetic whatever am so committed to and it was just great it was like a breath of fresh air coming in yeah, yeah that's that's really terrific when you yeah. when you can have someone that when you don't give someone a template for how you want the music to sound like or because I, I know that there's some filmmakers, what they do is they find they, they steal music from some other films and then I did that. and they layer it and they put it there and then they give it to a sound uh, recordist or sound composer and says something that sounds like this over these places. <laughs> and it's like, wow, you just did all my work for me. 
<laughs> so they not. Have, so I did uh, that, but I did that in an early pass using Beth's previous score material for previous films. Oh, we'll see now. That's for, different. <laughs> no, it's not. It's still the same thing. It's attachment to something, and it, it's sort of. I don't know, Beth. You could probably describe that more, but it felt like it was. Well, I had to fight her tooth and nail, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Beth, and I know that. That's what. That's I just. I really saw the opportunity to recreate some new stuff, which I was really keen to do, rather than use recycle old stuff. Yeah. I didn't allow her to recycle one old thing, so. Yeah, well, but it still it still works. It still works very well. So your collaboration really clicks very nicely. I was very very uh, taken with that. Okay. Um, let's see if there's is there anything else. Is, um, there was uh, oh in the editing process, you know, yeah. documentary film is is so weird because what I understand about it is that nobody knows what the film's going to be. You just shoot a lot of footage, lots of it. And then you have this, this thing, and then out of that, you have to find the story. What is the story you, you're right. trying to tell? Uh, what was that process like, and how did you work with your Well, editor? you'd think that we had a story. You, they cross, you, they arrive, they return. It's a, it's a journey structure. Like, you'd think it was like we just follow the horses. Yeah. Just follow the horses. But well, first of all, my editor, Daniel Mashari, is a genius. I'll just say that straight up. I'm not even like being hyperbolic about it. He's extremely talented. And um, working with him is like, makes it easy to, he, I mean, he probably killed his computer working on this film because it was just so much footage. Anyway. Um, yeah. Well, it's structured around the fiesta. So we know that's where it ends. We have idea that that's where it ends. We know that the opening of the fence is a climactic image. Um, <clears throat> we had had forever, the week before the Kabul Gata, there was an election for the mayor in the town of Columbus, which we had followed fairly closely and had, and was a whole nugget story that was in the film up until like last October when the we were just, mayor who's the pastor. And yeah. Who's a, yeah. But the, he replaced the mayor who's the bus driver, which was a very interesting oh. story. The bus driver was the former mayor. <laughs> but, you know, so but whatever, one of the things about being in the field is that I know all that. I see him sitting in the armchair. I say, he's the mayor. There's Philip Skinner, the mayor. No one else knows that. And no one else necessarily needs to know that if the story is actually about the Kabul Gata. And it became very clear that it was about how a number of different people had a different take on what it meant and what it meant to symbolize it and what it meant to enact it. I and I just sort of got into the part of it being a small town where people yeah. are, and I even could have a moment where they're like disagreeing with each other. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. So then it's like a more human thing because I, I felt that I will never make a conventional film. It's just not my nature. And so for, to, for me to make a historical film I, I became more interested in the fact that the border is a place where people live. It, it's not just a place where people pass through. So I wanted to sort of get a sense of being there a little bit, yeah. too. Yeah, especially when you have families that, that, live on, that, that live on both sides. They have right. uh, relatives on the other side of the fence that they need to keep in touch with. And so the... It just it just makes everything so complex. Given that, I have to commend you on not being overtly political as a filmmaker in the film at all. Just letting the situation speak for itself. Giving equal time to people who are clearly more right wing than those who, like the woman who said, I'm very liberal, I'm the liberal <laughs> one. The only reason they like me is because I'm funny. Yeah. <laughs> she was terrific. I July. Really Beth, were you going to say, were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that I, I really um, like how the character, the main characters have developed over watching the development of this film and how they've really pop out and, and are given vignettes. Yeah. 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 I like that. As well. structure. So, so anyway, you're to be, you're both to be commended for, for kind of, um, uh, your restraint, your, your, uh, on, mm -hmm. on your, on 
marking this, giving it a, a political statement, because the making of the film, making it about this experience is political already. It's immensely political. And, uh, yeah. But it's also educational. And I think it's a film that, that everyone who doesn't know what the border is like, what it's like to live there, what it's like to deal with the, the idea of a line in the desert that says, this side you're American and then that side you're a Mexican, um, uh, what, what that experience is like, because most people have no conception of what that world is like at all. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting uh, zone, this, this zone called La Frontera. Mm -hmm. Really, and I thought you did a beautiful job of, of capturing what it's like to live there. That thank you very much because that actually mattered a great deal to me, and it governed a lot of decisions around uh, subtitles. Beth and I were just talking about this this morning, um, so that there are points where if, if you're not bilingual, you will not understand everything in the film, but that's okay because that's actually how it goes. <laughs> I'm walking around with the translator all the time. So it is, and no one's, I don't, I'm not into the documentary title. This is who you're hearing. Yes. It's just a person talking and right. telling a story. And that's what goes on. You're a storyteller. <laughs> that's the frontera. Everyone's a storyteller. I was going to ask you about that, about like why you didn't <laughs> identify the, the people that were, that were listening to, because it seems like you were less interested in, in, uh, giving them a title and identifying them and more interested in just letting them speak and let, letting what they have to say identify them. Yeah, it's, a, it, it's either they name themselves, someone else refers to them, oh, you're the mayor. Um, and, and, and my end credits are like each of them is a character, you know, the, the grandson, the historian. But I also feel like that's a kind of, that's a kind of conceit that the, the, we call the lower third in documentary that is like authority. I have the right to speak uh -huh. on this because I'm Dr. So-and-so in the uh -huh. area of psychology or it's like, you know what? Everyone has a right to speak actually. Oh, um, that's so, interesting. So I wasn't into that because I'm actually not, because all of history's interpretation is fictional to some degree because it's interpretive. Very what it means, you know? That's so, really yeah. interesting. Very interesting. So, Kathy, what next? What, 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 what <laughs> happens now? Where do you take this film next? Or, or what? Who knows? <laughs> All the festivals are closed. But <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> you know, so but whatever. It's still being submitted to film festivals. And so it will have that world. But this, you know, all of my films languish. And I, this one can't languish. This one's got, it's like so accessible and it really is educational. And, and it's true, it doesn't fall prey to a lot of the sort of polemics of the border. Um, so I really want it to be seen. So, you know, whatever, I'll, I'll submit it to Independent Lens on PBS. Like I'll really see about getting it into the, you know, forefront of the world, if possible. And definitely, there should be a screening in Columbus. That almost Columbus. happened this past March. No, oh, they were, really? we, I actually wanted to run a screen on the fence and uh, project it. You know, I mean, the sound will be a tricky, oh, oh, cool. <laughs> tricky thing. They're into it. They were ready to do it this oh, March, okay. but the film wasn't quite done. Okay. And absolutely happening. Oh, absolutely yeah. happening. Definitely. It's just yes. Put a screen on there. That'd absolutely. But I don't know, I'm still working, I mean, in terms of a next project, I just need to chill out, but I, because um, yeah. this is my second feature in like three years, it's insane. Wow, wow. Yeah, I can't. Uh... Well, you know, the thing about this pandemic and the quarantining is that it enforces a sabbatical on people who are overworked, who are working too hard. You have to just take a break. There's no, you have no choice. Yeah, I can't wait till I stop teaching next week. Yeah. Because then you have a real uh, yeah. prolonged spell of downtime. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, that's good. The, See what happens. I, I'm also in that sort of state. You know, all my projects have canceled. So it means that uh, I don't have to race to the next one and I can catch my breath. And I, have, I haven't been working at all. 
So it was easy for when, when they called me to uh, conduct these interviews yeah. for me to say yes, because it's like, well, as long as it doesn't involve my writing. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> no, it's so great that you could do it really. It's it was enjoyable. It's really lovely. And also give me an opportunity not only to make a new friend, but to see an old friend. Yeah, uh, that's a great. Of mine, with whom <laughs> I've collaborated on four or five projects in years past. Nice. And so it's uh, really good to see you, Beth. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> now, uh, are, how are you dealing now with this pandemic? Are you, are you recording uh, or, or you clearly can't play? I just got hired to write another film score. What? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. <laughs> but plus, your CD just came out. And Transmission just put out a new CD. Good. Uh, which, you know, all, all my gigs have been canceled. So I, I am doing some outdoor playing at the new farm where I'm on the board and we're doing six feet distancing and playing outdoors. So that's been fun, but also uh, teaching via uh, FaceTime. Teaching I have my private students and, and I'm going to be uh, scoring Impresario, the uh, uh, trouser film um, documentary about Mark Hustis, who brings up the Hollywood <laughs> dames to the Castro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was, that would be fabulous. Yeah, I'm just starting that this week, so. Excellent, excellent. Well, congratulations <laughs> to you, Beth, on this, and to Kathy and Beth both on this terrific film, Crossing Columbus. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.